Hello, hello everyone. Long time no see. I know it's been, I think, approaching eight months, maybe nine months since I have come before you all. So, I mean, I won't say sorry about that. I, I owe the internet nothing, but um, hello again. In the intervening months since I have spoken with you, I have written a thesis, defended a thesis, finished my undergrad, moved out of my college town, and I am now getting ready to move to a different country. So what better way to procrastinate my packing than to speak to you all about the best books I read this summer. In terms of the qualifications for the books that ended up on this list, basically rating wise, they're all nine out of 10 or above. Also, I have pretty much none of these books except for the last few with me because with all of the moving and preparing to move again, a lot of my books are just in boxes in a storage unit. So bear with me, I'll put the pictures up of the cover, but it won't be till the end that I have a physical book to show you. The first book I wanna talk about is A Tree Grows in Brooklyn by Betty Smith. This follows the kind of coming of age of the main character, I believe her name is Franny. Um, this, when I read, quite a few months ago so details are a little hazy but it was good trust me it follows franny as she grows up in brooklyn new york in i believe beginning in like the 30s and then going into the 40s and basically just like her kind of coming into herself her growing awareness of the world beyond her it's a very quiet book not a lot of necessarily dramatic things happen and even when dramatic things do happen it's kind of just paced along within the story of the book and so in a sense like the whole plot is just watching this girl grow up and watching her really just come into herself and learn about the world around her. The book does a really wonderful job at just kind of showing the beauty and the comfort of those little mundane moments when you're young and when you know you don't know what the world is like outside of your own home, outside of your neighborhood. But then also when you get older and it begins to open up and it's both really exciting and invigorating to know that there's that whole world out there, but also a little scary and a little terrifying. And I think that the book really conveys that well. And it's just a comfort read in a sense. Like I just, I, I feel like it's one of those books that pairs very perfectly with like a warm cup of tea and just like cozying up with it and like slowly working your way through the story. The next book I want to talk about is As I Lay Dying by William Faulkner. Um, yes, this might sound pretentious of me, but hear me out. One of my friends wrote her thesis on this book and so I decided to read it and I am so glad I did. It basically follows the Bundred family after the death of their mother. So they have to get her from one little town in Mississippi to another little town in Mississippi to bury her. But along the way, it's just kind of like a comedy of errors, but also like really tragic because these people are like not good people and everyone has their own sort of reasons for actually wanting to get to this other town. And you get to see all the different perspectives of the family members as they're going along the journey and also the perspective of family friends and just other people kind of connected to them. And it is it's just so good. I think if you haven't read anything by him, it's a really good introduction. Before this book, I had read The Sound and the Fury and that was kind of a bit intense for me in terms of like having never encountered him before. I sort of wish I had started with Azalea Dying because it's a bit more manageable, the story is a bit more clear cut and I think there's still a lot of interesting like modernist things being done with the text and with perspective and with the limitations of like a first person perspective, but it's also done in a way that like I think is just an easier kind of introduction into his writing style. It also contains potentially the best single chapter of a book I have ever read in my life, the Addy chapter. Every page in that chapter is just, it's just like mind blowing to me that someone actually wrote that and thought that and like was able to articulate all of the complexity of that character. I don't wanna give like too much away about like the content of the chapter because it's just so, so good, so wonderful. It's a, one of those stories that's both very dark and very depressing, but also really funny and really bizarre. The next book I wanna talk about is a bit more quaint, a bit more cute. It is My Life in France by Julia Child. You might be familiar with Julia Child from the movie Julie and Julia starring Meryl Streep and Amy Adams, or maybe from the show Julia that just came out on HBO, or maybe you're just like, you know, a cooking aficionado and have worked your way through mastering the art of French cooking, or you don't know her at all. 
all options are okay. But basically, this is a memoir that she wrote with the help of her nephew, and it just details all of the different times that she lived in France and what was going on in her life, how her love for food and cooking grew in that country, and the appreciation that she develops for the French culture. Again, very just like warm and like light-hearted read. Most of the books I read are like pretty heavy and dark and kind of just like sit with you in a very troubling way. So this was a really wonderful lighter fare and still really fun and if you have seen interviews with her or have seen like some of the portrayals of her in movies and TV. She has a very distinct way of speaking and like you can just hear her voice saying the prose. Like it's just really a delightful experience. The next book I want to talk about is My Dark Vanessa by Kate Elizabeth Russell. This book has been going around a lot on the internet and for good reason. A another very difficult read, very challenging to get through, but I think very rewarding and very thought provoking and moving if you are able to handle the subject matter involved. It details the story of a girl who goes to a private school when she is I believe in high school uh, maybe around 13 14 years old and while at that school her English teacher ends up trying to basically pursue her though he is a grown man and she is obviously a child and it details that relationship as it continued even into her adult life and especially how the Me Too movement then challenged how she thought about that relationship because previously she was very steadfast in the belief that she was fully within her abilities to consent at the time because, you know, the alternative for her was so much worse to really comprehend what this man did to her and how this man affected her. As their relationship evolves and as the man continues to go further and further and push her further and further. Elizabeth Russell does not shy away at all from the grotesqueness of it all and the difficulty of being a child in that position. I hear a lot of people kind of say that it's like the Lolita of our time. I understand why the comparison is made for sure, but I think that's also kind of not the most apt comparison because definitely it is turning the perspective on predatory relationships and putting it away from the predator but actually on um, the survivor and so that in that way it is like a flipping of the script but also what Kate Elizabeth Russell is going for on the prose level it's very different from what like Nabokov was doing in Lolita so definitely don't go in expecting it to be like a just perspective reversal of Lolita it's a lot more than that it's very much its own thing but it is so good at what it's doing and so good as its own thing and yeah, I, I highly, highly recommend it. All right, the next book that I really enjoyed this summer is Another Internet Darling. It is The Idiot by Elif Batuman. This book basically follows the main character, Selen, as she goes into her undergrad, her first year at college, and kind of develops relationships, starts intellectually challenging herself, and getting crushes, having her first experiences in certain things, and eventually like studying abroad, all of that that kind of will encapsulate the kind of quintessential first year at college. I really loved Eva Patuman's writing. It's very sharp, very direct and to the point in a way that's like very funny at times. Her humor is really dry. I've heard the comparison before that she's like J.D. Salinger before the girlies and I think that that is very, very accurate. She is able to kind of show characters in ways that we can tell that they're not perfect. They're not always easy to root for, but you understand that like they're kids coming into their own and they're trying to figure themselves out and they're complicated and they're making mistakes and all of those things. And it felt like a very distinct voice and it was very perceptive, but also not trying to be like overly precocious or pretentious or anything like that. The next book I want to talk about is yet another classic. It is Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. I think a lot of people had to read this in school. I never did, but I had a copy and I just kept putting it off. But finally this summer I was like, I have to read it. I'm going to be like actively angry at myself if I do not read this. You know, I will say the first maybe like 100, 150 pages, I'll be honest. It was a little rough going at first, but then at a certain point, things just kind of get set into motion and it becomes so fun. Like it becomes 
really surprising and unexpected and like funny in ways that I was just not expecting at all. Previously the only Russian literature I had read was Tolstoy um, Anna Karenina so that's definitely I would not classify Anna Karenina as like funny and a, a good time to read but I got to a point in Crime and Punishment where anything could happen here at the end of any scene the character could like burst forth and you're like wait a minute how what how are you involved in the situation how do you connect all these people and then within the next chapter Dostoevsky explains it and you're like oh my gosh I did not expect that at all but it makes it so much more fun. Once I was able to get through kind of that initial groundwork of the first little section of the book I just really found myself flying through it and just being really really entertained at every turn. All right next we have The Unbearable Lightness of Being by Milan Kundera. This book follows a married couple at the start of World War II. They live in Prague and it's kind of about how they adapt to the war, how their relationship began and how it evolves and just all of the kind of complexities of relationships especially at that time and like in that place. But what makes this book really really interesting is Kundera will very frequently become very meta and talk about the characters as characters. He'll be describing something and then he'll say this is the image that first came to me about this character. This is what this character represents to me. And he'll kind of go on these just like little tangents but that are really really interesting about how he's trying to you know explore relationships how he's trying to explore the effect of war on people the effect of love childhood and neglect all of these things there are quite a few passages where he just goes on about like the nature of being a writer and of being a storyteller and of having all of these kind of lives living in your head and it was unlike any book i'd read before and it really just kind of opened up this whole new kind of way of writing to me that I really really loved. If you're kind of in the mood for a book that is both kind of like historical but also goes on a lot of like kind of philosophical avenues and everything like that, I really think you would enjoy this book and I really I'm glad that I read it when I did and that I found it and it was one of those that you know I could just read five ten pages and what was in those pages was so much food for thought that I would like set the book down and contemplate. The next book I want to talk about is Persuasion by Jane Austen. No, we're not talking about the movie. I don't want to talk about it. I have seen Fleabag. I love Fleabag. I love Persuasion, but they don't go together. The book, however, so, so good. It was just so delightful. And again, like Jane Austen just knows how to be funny like no one else. And I just loved the character of Anne, which is also why I hated the movie so much is because they just completely changed her character. But in the book, I really sympathize with Anne, seeing her really grow into herself and kind of develop her own opinions on other people and on the world and on what she wants for herself was really, really wonderful. There's this wonderful part of the novel that besides just like the love story involved, Jane Austen also really shows kind of the benefits of developing a friend group where you feel really seen and appreciated and valued. And that was one of the aspects that I don't see talked about a lot in the book, but when I was reading that portion of the book, I just found it so so sweet and so moving and so kind of true to the elements that go into really kind of becoming an actualized version of yourself. Next, I want to talk about French Maglia by Elena Ferrante. If you have not heard of Elena Ferrante, where have you been? She is without a doubt my favorite author. I wrote half of my thesis on her. Her series, My Brilliant Friend, top tier, amazing, 10 out of 10 all around. Her other books that I've read, um, I've read her first three books like prior to the Neapolitan novels, also so good. And Frantu Maglia is really interesting because it's basically a collection of interviews and email correspondence and letters written by her and to her during the creative process of her first three standalone novels and then the four Neapolitan novels. And also just if you aren't aware, Elena Ferrante is actually a pen name and no one knows her true identity. So it's very rare for fans of her work to get any sort of insight into her life or into her creative process because, you know, there's just not a lot of content about her really on the internet coming from her herself. It was really, really cool to really see why she has chosen to remain anonymous, how she has changed the way she wants to interact with her fans as the years go on because the letters cover about 20 years I believe. They start in the 90s and end in like the early 2010s. A really long period of time is covered and you really get to see her just develop as a writer and as a public figure even though that was never something she kind of expected to happen. I would recommend if you are interested in reading this and interested also in reading her other work she does discuss spoilers for her first basically seven novels so if you 
want to not be spoiled for them ahead of time, I would recommend reading Troubling Love, The Days of Abandonment, and The Lost Daughter, as well as the four Neapolitan novels before reading this. But again, she's an amazing writer. You won't have a bad time at all getting through her literary portfolio, if you will. It made me really just appreciate her even more. And it really made me admire how she is choosing to interact with the world on her own terms, even when there's immense pressure for her to be more open and more visible and how she is really committed to retaining her privacy and retaining the kind of sanctity of her own life away from the public sphere. Okay, next, I want to talk about the Copenhagen Trilogy by Tove Ditlifsen. Basically, it follows the writer Tove Ditlifsen from when she is a child and, you know, learning to live with her family when they're very poor and living in Copenhagen. And then her as a teenager, kind of getting a job, really realizing that she's in love with writing and poetry. And then finally, when she's an adult, she, she has a few marriages and then she later on struggles heavily with substance abuse and all about, you know, the trials she encountered, the different forces working against her in her day. What I feel like makes her story different is really the melancholy with which Tove kind of maintains her story even when she has like a success like say a poetry collection is published or she is in a relationship that she's really happy about or she gets you know admired by another great writer it is never very long until you know the forces that are working against her rear their head again and as kind of sad and depressing as that can be I felt like it was also very accurate to what many people do struggle with and it's like a single win is not going to take away all the hardships in your life and they're something that one has to continue fighting against in certain circumstances. It was another very hard read at times and you know by the end you have to sit with it for a while but when you do I think that it's very rewarding and it offers a really unique perspective. Both her being a like a Danish woman I had never really read anything set in World War II from like a Danish person's perspective so it was interesting to see how the war and the kind of after war years affected that country at least through Tove's perspective and also just to see how different women from around that time struggled to have their voices heard and struggled to make fulfilling lives for themselves when there were so many expectations that were kind of going against that. All right this is exciting we finally got into the part of the video where I have books that I can hold up and show you. The next little book, but not really book, that I want to talk about is Serious Concerns by Wendy Cope. This is a poetry collection. You know, I, like everyone else on the internet, came across her poem The Orange and fell in love with it. So I'm not original, I know that, but it's great for a reason. And I wanted to pick up the collection that The Orange comes from. Reading this poetry collection felt like meeting up with a long lost friend and just catching up over coffee and hearing all of their adventures that they'd been on, all of the little, the mundane things and the really important and impactful things that have happened to them in life. It was just so precious, both funny and very kind of twee and dry in a way, but also just very comforting. And I'm typically not like the biggest fan of like modern poetry. This was published originally, this was published originally in 1992. So it's not like super modern, but it is maybe the first time I've read like a modern-ish poetry collection and actually just really loved it and really felt excited to read every poem and excited to return to these poems in a, a few months or a few years when I'm just kind of wanting to be reminded of this collection. Let's find some favorites here. I need to set this down. Okay, here's a good one. Here's one that I think kind of shows her humor a lot that I really love. It's called Loss. The day he moved out was terrible. That evening she went through hell. His absence wasn't a problem but the corkscrew had gone as well. Funny little ruminations on life, on relationships, and I just found it, yeah, very refreshing. I feel like the overall theme of this summer and my reading is like a lot of really like dark and heavy and really like thought-provoking books. And then books that feel like taking a breath and taking a pause and just letting yourself relax a little bit. And that was definitely what this poetry collection felt like. I'm glad I read it and I really hope that more people read it and don't just kind of stop at the orange. The next book I really really enjoyed was Hood Feminism by Mickey Kendall. This book basically talks about how modern white feminism has not been intersectional enough to really help women of color combat the problems that they most often face and it really just argues for a more intersectional approach and challenges topics that maybe like mainstream feminism doesn't consider feminist necessarily but which for women of color and for marginalized community very much are feminist issues and are topics that impact their life every single day and impact their safety and their families and their friends and everything like that. 
So I found this book just really, really helpful for me just as also like a temperature check on kind of how I show up for the women in my life and how I define my feminism and how I kind of practice that. And also just a good alternate perspective because something that Mickey Kendall talks about a lot is that a lot of the kind of major players in the feminist movement today are white women. And in order to really fully help women around the world and in different socioeconomic situations, it's really necessary to have more voices in the room and more diverse voices in the room. And just a good eye opener into how different communities and populations are working to both enact feminism for the benefit of like the women in their community but also for the benefit of the community as a whole and really just what that looks like and how an intersectional approach can really benefit marginalized communities. All right next I want to talk about Luster by Raven Leilani. This book follows a woman who is in like her mid to late 20s She's kind of lost in life. She's kind of chaotic. She's very much like fitting in with the unhinged woman kind of trope that is very popular right now. And she starts an affair with a married man. And when her housing situation falls through, she ends up moving in with his family when the wife knows that they've had this relationship. And from there, things just kind of spiral out. What I really loved about this book especially was the way that Raven Leilani writes. She does a great job going from these like very darkly funny observations to then these very kind of brutal and gut-wrenching moments of introspection on the part of the main character in how her relationship with men has been shaped by her environment and by her previous relationships and how she doesn't necessarily value her own safety and her own fulfillment in a lot of ways because she's just been constantly beaten down by life for so many years. Raven Leilani's writing really just like packs a punch and really pulls you right into this character's perspective and does not let you go and it was just really interesting and really insightful to read and i also think that similar to elena fronte raven leilani is really good about describing a situation that seems so bizarre and so improbable and taking it like just to the edge where like if she went an inch further it would just become like ridiculous but she keeps it restrained enough that it seems very plausible and it seems like Dang, like this is something that could happen to people and this is how they'd react and this is how those characters would just interact with each other um so yeah i really enjoyed this it's also only like 200 something pages so a really short read really easy to just kind of get through and just be fully taken into this very very intense and very again darkly witty and very self-deprecating but also insightful and really just complex narrator. The very last book I want to talk about is Song of Solomon by Toni Morrison. I'm not saying anything new here when I say that Toni Morrison is a really really wonderful writer. The first book I read by her was Beloved I believe like a year and a half ago and I just fell in love with that. It remains one of the best books I've ever read and Song of Solomon has now entered the same stratosphere as Beloved for me. It basically follows this character named Milkman as he grows up from being a child in I believe the Detroit area. They never specifically mention it but I believe it. he lives in Detroit and then becoming like a man and really trying to find his place in the world especially as a black man in a black community figuring out how he wants to relate to people and how he wants to just interact with the world and how he wants to treat people there's a lot of family stories that he is told by his parents as he grows up that really just complicate his worldview and he has trouble holding that all in his head and holding all of that history that came before him but that did shape him he has trouble just kind of working through that it's a really really cool book because it's both in many ways kind of like your traditional hero's journey type book but then also Toni Morrison does a wonderful job kind of critiquing the idea of a hero's journey and how we view heroes as heroes and if the people who go off and take on this wonderful and like exciting and sometimes dangerous adventure if they're really doing so for the good of their society or if they're doing so to kind of fulfill their own selfish desire for knowledge or for status or for power or for the desire to get away from what they already know and how much of that can be for the people you leave behind and how much of that is just really a way to escape the people you want to leave behind. It's just one of those that like once you finish reading it you just you just want to like hug it and be like thank you Toni Morrison. Thank you for for giving us this gift. So yes I have no idea how long this video is going to end up being so if you did watch it all the way to the end thank you so so much. I really hope that you enjoyed it. I really hope that you got some good recommendations from all the books I talked about. 
and you know if you read any really great books this summer please let me know alas i probably need to get back to packing and by get back i mean begin packing because the work i've done has been so minimal as to be non-existent thank you thank you so much for watching i really hope that i can pop on here every now and then and make a video for you guys maybe provide some light entertainment yes i hope you all have such a good day and i will see you in the next one bye